Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland and behind me is William Hazlitt's house. Indeed that's the house where he died. Um, so Hazlitt um, is known well for being a writer of, of so many kinds. I think he never wrote a novel but apart from that he wrote just about everything else. He wrote newspaper articles, he wrote uh, literary reviews, he wrote like, literary studies of, of, of all Shakespeare's characters, uh, he composed poetry um, and um, works in philosophy and so on. Um, so he was a man of diverse uh, literary talents, a bit of a polymath, dipped into science and higher mathematics as well. So um, William Hazlitt was um, born in 1778 in Maidstone, which is in Kent, just outside London, the southeast. He was the namesake of his father, who was a Unitarian minister. So uh, our William Hazlitt, who was Irish on his father's side, his father had been coming for, come from Tipperary. So the Hazlitts had a very, uh, um, what's the word, peripatetic existence. So they moved from Kent, they lived in, uh, back in, moved back to Ireland, lived in Bandon, they moved to the United States briefly. When he was a toddler, he could scarcely remember that. And then back to this country in various different places when his father's finding new congregations. So his father was quite a well-known Unitarian minister. He'd attended the University of, uh, of Glasgow and sat at the feet of um, Adam Smith. So um, Hazlitt himself, he went to, he was um, homeschooled for a while, and then he went to um, a special uh, college in London which was supposed to prepare him to be a Unitarian minister. So he had a very inquiring mind, and he was not afraid to go wherever the evidence led, and it led him to, to, to doubt Christianity, much to the chagrin of his uh, parents. Um, so he read voraciously, um, not just in English, he read things like by Montaigne and de la Rochefoucauld in the original, he learned a bit of German too. Obviously his education is mostly in Latin and ancient Greek. And he let, read all the classics of, of, of um, English literature. So he decided he wouldn't be a, a, a um, Unitarian minister. And he supported himself mostly by, um, uh, by writing. He spent some time in the West Midlands. And once he was at a church where Samuel Taylor Coleridge came to preach. Uh, Coleridge, the, um, uh, the poet. Because Coleridge, though the son of an Anglican priest, was considering becoming a uh, Unitarian minister himself. He never did, by the way. Sorry, I should point out, Unitarians are a type of Protestant, a type of Christian. And Unitarians, they, they disbelieve in the Trinity. They got a different notion of God. But they were, so there were dissenters, they were outside the established church. And they were discriminated against by law. So he knew um, Dr. Richard Price, the famous dissenting minister back then. And was, I think, in Newington Green in London. There, there are a lot of dissenters around there. And dissenters were quite often politically radical because the political establishment was connected to the established church, the Church of England, and they discriminated against saying that there should be something closer to equality, maybe not total equality, probably not equality for women, but for most men, the right to vote for more men, greater freedom of expression, and so on, uh, tended to be more sympathetic towards the French Revolution. I remember, so he was like um, 11 when the French Revolution took place. Um, he found patriotism rather distasteful. He detested oppression in all its forms. He thought the British government was fairly oppressive. He thought some foreign governments were even worse. Um, so he made his, his living as a pamphleteer, often publishing things at his own expense, and he had precious little money and hoping they'd sell, which they didn't always. So works of political philosophy. He knew William Godwin, who'd written Political Justice, that famous coffee house owner, um, the, uh, the, the one who was the, later the father-in-law of Shelley. Um, uh, Hazlitt, he knew Keats, um, he knew William Wordsworth, uh, he knew Robert Southey, uh, just about all the famous writers at that time. So far as I know, he never met Shelley or Lord Byron, but he, he moved in those literary circles. He knew Charles and Mary Lamb, a very famous literary couple, and indeed he married Mary Lamb's sister, um, because the, the maiden name was Stoddart. He did that mainly because he was, they were going to get, get um, a good inheritance, or this trust was set up for them £100 a year, which was a considerable sum in those days. Um, you could put two zeros on the end, so that might be just about enough to live on, um, uh, considering a lot of people were, were virtually starving at the time, and so that was a big boost to him. They had three children, only one of them, a son, um, survived. Um, but his, his marriage did not go terribly well, as you can imagine. Uh, in, 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 as a middle-aged man, he um, uh, fell in love with this girl 22 years younger than him, and he was trying to get a divorce from his first wife. Um, and that was no easy matter, it was very expensive. Uh, very time-consuming and regarded as utterly disgraceful for the sin against as well as the sinning. And he hadn't actually managed to get that divorce when he discovered his uh, the, this one to whom he was affianced was actually carrying on with somebody else. He didn't marry her in the end. He did have a second marriage. I think it was his first wife died. So he lived mostly in London. He liked going to the countryside as well. 
he greatly appreciated um, uh, natural beauty. It's part of the Romantic movement and felt that this was, that was overlooked. That's what, the, that's what the Romantic movement is about. Its paradigm is um, wilderness. Just let things grow, be the way they are, because nature is good and humans are born good. And so-called civilization with excessive rigidity and um, these artificial modes of behavior, they make us bad. They take our natural goodness out of us and uh, introduce hierarchy, inequality, cruelty, and all the rest of it. So just let it be. Whereas obviously a traditionalist at the time believed that, that mankind without constraints was the beast unbound, that really man is born bad and we have to be straight jacketed in a sense by, by, by civilization. That's a good thing to make us better, to make us more human. Um, whereas you see, romantic, the romantic self besides the opposite contention. The romantic movement as a literary and artistic movement was not simply um, about, was not about romantic love only, but, there was, but that was part of it. And again, some people, the, the mainstream thought that romantic love was almost a mental illness back then. You got to marry for money. Um, uh, so uh, what else was I going to point out? Yeah, it was admirer A.W. Schlegel, the German philosopher, translator of Shakespeare. And after the Napoleonic Wars were over, he traveled extensively in France, Switzerland, Italy, and uh, Germany. Though I don't think he actually ever met, met Schlegel. Um, he loathed Bonaparte, but he thought that this war wasn't worth fighting. Um, the United Kingdom liked to overlook the fact that it was back backing many despotic regimes as well that were just as bad as Napoleon and in a few cases worse. Um, so he was an opponent of slavery, he thought women ought to have greater rights, and he was a painter too. He was a, was a famous self-portrait he, he painted at the age of four and twenty. So here we are living in Soho, which then as now was a rather bohemian area of the town, a little bit little bit cosmopolitan. I mean these days part of it's the red light district and indeed the gay village. And uh, it was partly a red light district at the time, not so much a gay village. Um, so um, yes, Hazlitt, he wasn't very well off towards the end of his life despite living here because it wasn't considered so desirable as it is now. And that was very central. Of course, London was much, much smaller back in those days. He believed the death penalty would be used to use more sparingly. More people would be granted the right to vote. So um, uh, he published numerous works on, on issues like that. He dipped into philosophy. He thought that pedantry was really underrated. Uh, some people say, why are you writing this useless stuff? Um, anyway, so then he, he died in 1830, 10 years after his father, who was a well-recognized political figure, but didn't have very much money. He's buried in St. Anne's churchyard, which you can't see from here, only about a quarter of a mile away, which is over there. Now, he's scarcely read these days, um, but there, there is a Hazlitt Society to blazon forth his um, glory. It was quite made of book about, about, about 10 uh, years ago. He has his admirers, notably Tom Paulin. I've got that right. He was sometime professor of poetry at Oxford University. Paulin, that is, not Hazlitt. So uh, that's just um, a little bit about um, uh, William Hazlitt, who used to be more appreciated well into the, into the 19th century um, and was incredibly industrious as a writer. He produced volumes of work, four volume uh, biography of Napoleon, for example. That is just a little bit about William Hazlitt. Toodaloo.